2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Probably finish it up tonight if we can get through it all. It's not much there. Well, we actually we actually left off in verse 12 of chapter 2 uh, last time, if you remember. Uh, so we'll kind of do that, start there, and, and, and kind of work our way around. See what happens, all right? So uh, it's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, let's have a moment of prayer, and then we'll get going. Lord, we love you and we thank you for today and I thank you for the time that we can set aside for Bible study and fellowship uh, as a church family and we just ask you to continue to bless us in that way and help us to come in here and open up our hearts and minds to this truth that we uh, have in front of us and be submissive to your spirit as he has his way in our hearts and allows us to apply it the way that you would have us to do uh, to apply the truth. Help us, Lord, to understand. Help us, Lord, to go into the world and share it with others and help us be who you want us to be. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, 2 Thessalonians, is uh, we know, is a follow-up from the first letter dealing with the Thessalonian believers or the believers in Thessalonica. And they, uh, like every other church, were having struggles with false teachings and persecutions and uh, just living in the world at the time. And the church today still has the same kind of struggles, just different cultures and different, uh, the, the different way that those things are coming at, coming at us. So we just need to ask the Lord to help us see what's happening and, and figure out how we can be like the Thessalonians when the, as they were being faithful and also uh, take the instruction of Paul so that we might... Uh, continue to be disciple makers. We talked last week about a man of lawlessness and we talked about again, once again, talked about the return of Jesus and, and some of the things that might may happen or will happen before Jesus comes back and after Jesus comes back and how all that might play out and how we're not to be super concerned about it and how we're not to spend all of our time worrying about it and looking for it and just be ready for it is what Paul's trying to tell this church. Paul's trying to tell this church to be ready, just know about it and be ready, eagerly wait for it. But he's also trying to say, get busy, be in the church, stay busy, be in the church. And he's saying, uh, most of you are doing good. Most of you are uh, uh, standing firm in the faith and it looks, your witness is great. According to the first letter that that they, uh, Timothy came back with a report that they they were faithful and they were still believing what they first believed and they weren't falling back and they weren't shrinking back because of the persecution and the false teachings and all of that. So he's once again writing this letter, trying to encourage them to continue to endure and continue to persevere and continue to remember what they were first taught. And the problem that the reason for this letter, if you remember, is, is they 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 were receiving teaching that some were saying was from Paul that wasn't from Paul that was actually telling them that they were insinuating that they had missed Jesus, right? They'd missed the bus, remember? And that, if you think about it, that's kind of a concerning thought, I would think. You know, if, if, if I woke up one day and, and genuinely thought that Jesus had come back and I had uh, uh, somehow missed that opportunity for whatever the reason would be, that would be a, a, a grave concern for me. And uh, you, so you can imagine what the, what the problem is and why there was a need for this letter. So he's, he's once again explaining us uh, in some detail. He's, it, it, we, we noticed in chapter 2, verse 2, that it says uh, uh, to not be quickly shaken from your composure, remember? Not to be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it is from us. In other words... Stay calm in your faith. Stay strong in your faith. Have confidence in the truth that you believed. The truth that when you believed it, you were saved because of your faith. So have confidence in what the Lord is doing and has done. And just don't freak out. Right? That was really, I mean, that's kind of his intellectual way of saying that. Okay? So then he started describing a little bit about, okay, Here's what here's some things that have to happen before Jesus returns. And he's talking that's when he starts talking about the man of lawlessness and all of that chaos and all of that 
that's going to happen beforehand. We go all the way down where we where we stopped uh, in in verse ten. Well, yeah, let's uh, uh, verse ten. He's well, he's in the middle of a thought, and he says, "With all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved." Remember, he's saying, "Okay, there's those who are believing, and they and they will not miss Jesus." They won't, they won't miss the opportunity to go and be with the Lord, but there's, there's those who are wicked and want to be wicked and love their wickedness and they will not repent and they will perish. And remember, we, we kind of talked about how God will not force himself on people and he will give us the desires of our hearts every time, always. And that's a hard thing to receive sometimes because when people are choosing the wickedness, Rather than choosing God and His ways, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to get our mind wrapped around how God would give them the desires of their heart because He wants all to be saved. He doesn't want people to live in their in their sin. However, this is a another uh, indication that that we could understand that even though God's love is for all, He doesn't force it on anyone. He doesn't make us receive it because that's not genuine love. All right, so that's that. I think that's the beauty of our Lord, right? Because that 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 makes me understand that God's love is more than just what we understand love to be. Most generally, it's it's super special, uh, super powerful, and there's nothing else like it in the world or in the universe, for that matter. So I that, I definitely want that. All right, so then we'll go where we picked where we left off. He says in verse eleven of chapter two. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. And if you're not careful, you can misunderstand that. We said that the reason God allows that, that God does that, is because that's what they want. Okay? He doesn't want them to want that, but that's what they want. And if we can get ourselves to understand and then get others to understand that this whole gospel is all about God not only loving us, but also giving us the opportunity to choose to love him. And that's what salvation is really all about. It's all about God saying, do you love me? And the answer is yes or no. That's it. That's as simple as it is. Uh, Okay, now verse 12 in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took look, took pleasure in wickedness. And most decent folks, saved or not, would could never instinctively take that statement and apply it to yourself. You know, we don't say, well, I don't take pleasure in wickedness. We say that about ourselves because we're all good people, right? Say amen. We're all good people. You know, because we all do good things and we know we all sin, but we don't see ourselves as wicked people because we are decent people. And it's really because we know that we don't really or we think we don't really take pleasure in the wickedness. But here's some reality check for us all. No one ever sins involving things they don't like or want. Every sin is something we desire, something we think we need, something that we believe is going to give us pleasure or something we believe is going to help us or whatever the case is, no one ever sins in a way that would turn their stomach. That's why we sin. That's why temptation is what it is, right? It's just not, we're not going to look at something that we really, that just... (laughs) That, that just makes us sick and say, yeah, I need that. I got to have that. No, Satan's better than that when it comes to his lies. He's, he knows what you like. He knows what you think you need. He knows what your weaknesses are, and he will put all that in front of you. And he is a master at shining apples to make them look good. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves taking pleasure in wickedness. If that makes sense. All right. Now, don't get discouraged because now today's study uh, will help us with this. Verse 13, 
It says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, talking to the believers there uh, in Thessalonica, uh, brethren, be, uh, uh, beloved by, our, by the Lord because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Verse 13. He just said a mouthful right there in that one verse, if you think about everything he said. He said uh, we, could, he, we could dwell on that for days and days and days and uh, continue to be feed. It's like a, it's like you, it's like a big piece of uh, spiritual meat that you just chew on for a long time and enjoy the protein that comes out of it that's healthy for you. Because he, he just said there's people that take pleasure in wickedness and there's consequences for that. But he's trying to get them to understand that they're not the one. They're, that's not them. Because you, you're children of God. And why are we children of God? He says, we're thanking God for you. Notice he says, it says in, in the New American Standard, it says, comma, it says, brethren be loved by the Lord. So he's like, we're thanking God for you, those of you who are loved by God. Right? And we all know that God loves everybody. Right? But he's talking about those who actually love God back. He says, God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. So this is a little bit, uh, a little bit more parts of scripture where people can, uh, they will understand that this is uh, predestination ideas. It's, that's not what it means, right? It, it can sound like that and you can make a pretty good argument that it means that, but it, it doesn't agree with other parts of scripture to, to mean that there's people are predestined to be saved and some are predestined not to be saved. You know, like there's no free will. So don't think that, don't go down that road if you can help yourself. All, he's saying, look, the, God has chosen you from the beginning. Who does God choose? Who did God choose to be saved from the beginning, from the very beginning? And John three sixteen answers that. The simplest answer, all who will believe can be forgiven, will be forgiven. All right, so every, anyone, who, anyone who believes, anyone who is saved by faith is, are the ones who's cho- who are chosen by God. In fact, these ones in verse 12 who, who, to, who took pleasure in wickedness, he chose them too, but they didn't, cho- they didn't choose him. That's the issue when it comes to saved or not saved. That's the issue when it comes to those in the world who believe that just God just loves everybody so nobody's going to be separated from him in a place called hell just because God's love is for everybody. Well, God's love is for everybody. He does love everybody. He has chosen everybody, but the only ones that are uh, considered to be those who are saved are those who choose him. So that's why he's saying, God has chosen you from the beginning. He's, those who are going to be with me, God says, for eternity are the ones who will choose me when this is all said and done. So he's just trying to encourage them right now. He's like, look, you guys have nothing to worry about here. You haven't missed the second coming of our Lord and you're not involved with those who who take pleasure in wickedness and reject God's love because you love God. You, by faith, received the truth about Jesus. All right, and then he says, you're, not only were you chosen, but you're chosen from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and faith in the truth. All right. We're chosen for salvation. We're chosen to be saved. We're chosen to be reconciled. God chooses to reconcile us to him. That's what the cross is all about. And I I wish, I wish people could understand who are not saved could understand that God did not have to do anything about the problem of sin. He could have just scrapped it all and either started over with his creation or just not create anything at all. He could have done that, but he chose this whole thing from before Genesis chapter one till after the end of Revelation. That's, that's his plan. That's his way. Because he wants those he loves to be with him for eternity because they love him. All right. So he's like, you're being saved from the beginning. You're being, you're safe. You're uh, you're chosen for salvation 
through sanctification. All right, sanctification is just a process of being made holy or the process of being cleaned up from your, the dirt from your sin is being washed away, scrubbed off. Work in progress is what we are, right? We're all being sanctified as we go along. If we, if we stay close to the Lord and we pay attention to his spirit, as he said, sanctified, sanctification by the spirit, it's the word of God and the Holy Spirit that cleans everything up. And if we're not growing in Christ and we're not being sanctified, then we're kind of remaining who we are and we're not fully absorbing and stepping into what Jesus did on the cross. Right. And it's, and it's hard. Sanctification is hard for us because it means we have to let go of things that we like. We have to let go of things that are we see we, that seem to be dear to us. Right. If sin was not so dear to us, we would have already let it go on our own. Right. So so spirit of God and the word of God is gently opening up our fingers and helping us let go willingly let go of the things that don't honor God. That's that's repentance. He doesn't jerk things away from us. He doesn't forcefully take sin away from us because it has to be our choice to repent or it's no good. Right. Because nothing about the Lord is forced. When it comes to his love and our repentance and our love to him. All right. So so we're through sanctification by the spirit of God and faith in the truth. Faith in the truth. So we have everything there. We have Jesus on the cross. We have the spirit of God and we have the word of God all there. All are part of us being not only being saved, but being made holy and being prepared as a church to be the bride of Christ. Because when Jesus comes back, the picture is that Jesus is coming to get to 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 get his bride. See, it's a wedding picture. And it's that kind of a commitment that the church is supposed to be making toward our Savior, right? Question is, are we allowing the Spirit of God to get us ready for that moment or not? And if we think that we're holding back the rest of the church, we're not. If we're not getting ready, if we're not letting the Lord work on us, if we're not growing spiritually as individuals or even as a congregation, we're not holding the church back. We're just being left behind. The church is going forward. The body of Christ is being prepared for the Lord and his return. What he's trying to tell them is keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. Get busy getting close to God and serving the Lord and, and living in your faith. Because when Jesus comes back, you, you need to be prepared for that. And the spirit of God and the truth of God is what prepares you for that. That's what the process of sanctification is all about. Being prepared for when Jesus comes back. <clears throat> All right. So verse 14 says it was, <clears throat> it was for this. He called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I had to read that four or five times uh, as I was rereading for tonight, because it's like we do, initially because we, we, we try to be humble about things, Right. And we all understand that it's God who gets the glory. We don't ever want to take what belongs to God as believers because he is king. He is Lord. And to God be the glory always. But this says right here that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just sit back and I'm like, OK, well. That can't be wrong because that's what Paul is encouraging. Yeah, it can't be out of line. It can't mean what it initially, it sounds like. So what is it? What what is it about? What does it mean to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ? And and it makes it makes me as I think about this. It, it I think about when we stand in the presence of God. You know, you, you think about what Hebrews teaches about uh, the, the 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 throne of God is is wide open for the believer because of the blood of Christ. And we can we can not only we can stand before uh, uh, God with confidence because we're covered in the blood of Christ and we're no longer standing in our sin because we can't be in the presence of holiness in our sin. So we have to be covered by the blood of Christ. And Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is teaching us that God has opened the door so that we can be in his presence and he invites us into his presence. And when he sees the believer, he sees one who is covered by the blood of Christ. See, 
So I'm thinking, so I, I, I see these words that gaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ would look like one who is covered by the blood of Christ. One who looks righteous because we're covered by his righteousness, by his holiness. We're being made holy because he's holy. Meaning the spirit of God is alive in us and there's less, there's less of me living anymore, more of him living in the world and in this body and in this, in this life. And as I continue to die to self and, 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 and live in Christ, more and more of God's glory is shown in my life or your life or our, our the church's witness. And it's all due to uh, the truth and the spirit of God and what Jesus did on the cross. And he's saying that how, the, how you stepped into this is because you believed the gospel that was preached to you. <clears throat> The power of the gospel as the first four or five verses of chapter one into the letter of, to the Colossians says you guys he, remember he says you guys were saved you guys received by faith the gospel that we preach that's why you're saved you see it's the power of the gospel that brought salvation to your knowledge and it's your faith that brought it into your heart. So he's saying the same thing to them. So, so then, brethren, verse uh, 15, stand firm. Write this down, circle it, underline it, stick it on your forehead if you have to. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or mouth or by letter from us. Okay, the reason I said write that down, stick it on your forehead or... Circle it, memorize it, whatever you got to do, because now he's beginning. He's he, first off, he's saying he's encouraging them that they haven't missed the, the teaching that they heard was wrong. It's not that nobody's missed Jesus. By the way, you're all are doing great. There's nothing to worry about. And keep on growing in Christ until the day comes because God loves you and the work is being done in you. And then he's going to tell them how to do that while they're waiting for Jesus. And the first thing he says is to stand firm. I don't know if we really understand how to do that sometimes. We think we do, or we try to really hard, but I don't know if we really understand how to stand firm. And I think sometimes when we struggle with that is because we don't really know where to stand. If we could just know where to stand, we could stand firm. Especially in a world like in our world today that we live in, there's so, there's so, there's so many controversial uh, topics or controversial issues that go on in the world. And there's this, it seems like there's this big uh, debate about how are we supposed to love people? What does it look like? One group of believers says it looks like this. And another group of believers says it looks like that. And this group of believers says that the way they're doing it is compromise. And this one over here says the way they're doing it is some other word that's opposite of compromise, right? You, you might even, some of them might even use the word hate because this church is standing firm here and that church over here sees standing firm in a different light. And what ends up happening is all the ones on the planet that are calling themselves believers show to the world that we're not really standing anywhere because we can't even agree. Does that make sense? Now, everything I just said is what I perceive when I look at the world and when I look at the church. But I say that as a perception from my, my perception. But the reality is, is the church is still being the church in the world today. The, the church is still as strong as it ever has been today. Okay. It's still struggle. It still struggles just like it ever has been all throughout the time since Acts chapter two, the struggles have always been there and there's always uh, seasons of times when it's successful and when it's thriving and then times when it shrinks back and time, it's just the church is a living thing, a living being. Right. So, so when he says to stand firm, he's, he's more talking about pay attention to the spirit of God in your life and do what he says to do in every moment and everything in every situation. Because he's not going to tell us anything outside of what the word of God tells us. 
He's not going to tell us anything in contradiction to what the word of God tells us. And I think sometimes it's hard to stand firm because we have other believers who believe that they're going to stand firm in a different way, which is opposite of us, right? So then we start questioning, are we really standing firm or are they really standing firm or are they wrong or are we wrong? And we start worrying about everybody else's walk instead of asking the Lord about our walk. You notice he wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, not to just the, not to not to just, not the Thessalonians and the Colossians and the, and the and the Ephesians. He didn't put everybody's name on it, even though it got passed around. Right? It got passed around, and everybody got the truth from it. But this is what they were struggling. For. He's like, look, you all have to stand firm. You have to know what the teaching is. You know, you know what we taught you when we were there. So why are you considering this false teaching to erase the truth from your mind? No, stand firm in what you put put your faith in. And I think we, I think as we, as we, the longer we walk with Christ, uh, the longer, the more time that goes by since the day you got saved, the day we got saved, the harder it is to stand firm because we sometimes get so far away from that moment when we first believed that we forget why we first believed. We forget what teaching we learned that caused us to first say, you know what, this is true. I got to put my faith in this. I got to repent, you know, and it's just, we get comfortable being believers, being saved. And sometimes uh, we get away from the words, uh, uh, word of God a little bit. Sometimes we neglect our walk. Sometimes we don't uh, pay attention to the spirit of God. We're just people, right? We, we're not perfect at it. But when those things happen, it's like, okay, when false teaching comes in, we don't really have a solid memory of what to compare it to. And we, we don't even know that we might be compromising because we're just, oh, that sounds good. Let me take that as true. Not, not even remembering that it doesn't agree with what we first believed. It doesn't agree with what the Bible taught us or what whoever the witnesses were in your life that helped you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That's why the Bereans were praised for their behavior. They checked everything to the word of God. They heard teaching and they were like, okay, hold on. We're going to go look at the word and see what, what, what lines up. And then they would, that's how they would decide what to believe. That's how you stand firm. And he says, look, hold to the traditions which you were taught. You know, walk the way we taught you to walk. Sometimes, I, the, sometimes the words that this translation or any other translation uses are, in our, in our culture can be confusing because uh, the word traditions can be an ugly word, can get in the way of church growth sometimes. And Sometimes traditions are necessary. Like, for example, just for example, we, we, as far as I'm concerned, we will always uh, share in communion together on Sunday morning. That tradition, as far as I'm concerned, will not stop. No matter what we have to do to grow, no matter how we change as a church, we will have communion. Because it's for the purpose of remembering our Savior and everything it took for us to be saved. Okay, so I'm not saying traditions are bad. But I'm also saying sometimes traditions get in the way of growth when it comes to what the, what, how we use the word traditions. What he's talking about is he's talking about the doctrinal truths that we taught you about Jesus and about sin and about salvation. In the three day, remember it was three day, three days of preaching how this church got started before Paul had to move on for fear of being killed. So he's, how much could they have learned? Well, they learned quite a bit. Paul would preach until people fell out of a window. Remember that? He'd sit there and just teach until everybody fell asleep. You know, y'all can just praise the Lord that your preacher don't do that. Hello? Just seeing if you're here, that's all. <laughs> uh, so there's traditions are good. Traditions are healthy. And when, when he's talking about traditions, I believe he's talking about important doctrines, things that cannot change. Okay. When it comes to the truth about Jesus, truth about our salvation, which namely he just went through in verse 13, by the way. All right. So, uh, so then he goes in verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, our father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. 
Sometimes, I, sometimes Paul says things that just make me want to be better. <laughs> you know, because whenever I'm talking to people on the phone or in person or whatever the case is, I try to be nice and say that the Lord loves you and God bless you and stuff like that sometimes. But that's, I mean, if I would have said what he just said, I would have said, hey, Lord bless you. I pray for you. That's the extent of it. That's all he said. It's really all he said. But he says it and he's just like on and on, just lavishing them with blessings, words that are blessing them. He's like, look, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope and great by grace. He's just making sure that y'all understand who he's talking about. He's making sure that y'all understand not only who he's talking about, but what he's done for you. And why this is important that I'm, that he's even asking, here's who I'm talking to about you. It's the one who loves you this much. It's the one who's given you so much. And then he's like, He's praying for comfort and strength in their hearts because he's telling them, stand firm. Don't put up with nonsense. Don't put up with bad teaching. Don't shrink back just because something's different. And by the way, I know it's hard, so I'm just going to ask the one who can do it all to give you what you need. I'm going to ask him to give you strength. I'm going to ask him to give you comfort. I'm going to ask you, uh, him to bless your hearts in every, uh, everything that you're doing. And if, and if that doesn't encourage a person, they're, they're not paying attention. There's something wrong. Because y'all know as well as I do that the, one, the, most, the most powerful thing we can do for another person is go talk to our father for that person. You can hug them. You can smile at them. You can even cry with them. You can spend time with them. You can cook food for them, which we love to do. You can hold their hand. You can just... Sit quietly with them in their time of need. But none of that is as powerful as going and talking to God about them. And that's all he's saying. He's like, look, I know it's hard, but we're, we're, we're bigger and better than we feel. We're stronger than we feel because we have God. We have a Savior that has given us every opportunity to be who we are and stand firm. So you haven't missed Jesus. The teaching you're hearing is, is false. It's not for me. Let's get busy. Let's stand up against all of this and be who Jesus died for us to be. And by the way, I'm going to be talking to God so that you'll have everything you need so you can do it. Right? I, I love when we as believers spend a lot of time being strong talking truth in the face of adversity or in the face of false teaching or discouragement or someone comes against us or try to try to knock us down or discourage us for, for whatever reason. And we say, you know what? I know, I know different. I know the Lord. I know the truth. I'm not accepting that. Or maybe it's just hardship in our life, or maybe it's just some, some uh, bad things going on or some trauma and everything about our heart is saying, uh, I give up. I can't do it anymore. It's too hard. When we need our church, right? We need our Lord. That's when the Lord expects us to be strong in him, his strength. I don't know how many times I've been uh, at, at funerals or hospitals or at someone's home after some bad things have happened. I'm talking like people who have been with the Lord saved for a long time. And they, the, I'm, I'm showing up as their preacher. To try to encourage them, try to say, say something that would help them. And they spend all their time preaching to me while they're dying. It's, it's amazing to witness. And, and I suddenly realized the Lord's like, your job is to just stand there and be present. Because what they're talking about and everything they're saying is evidence of what I'm doing in this situation. Right? So that is what he's trying to teach the Thessalonians. He's not trying to tell them to work hard to get to be like these people. He's saying, you are these people. This is who you are, so let's just let the world see it. And let each other see it. All right, first th verse 1 of chapter 3. <clears throat> he's getting ready to get serious with them. How much time we got? We got a little bit. We might get through this. 
Finally, brethren, don't you don't y'all love it when the preacher says finally? <clears throat> finally, brethren, pray uh, for, uh, for us, pray for us. We're praying for y'all, so y'all pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as, uh, just as it did also with you. Two things here. He's saying, uh, he's giving them uh, understanding, hopefully, that they're not alone in this church work, right? They're not, they're not the only ones in the world trying to preach the gospel and trying to be the witness for the kingdom. We're over here doing it too, y'all. So y'all pray for us. We're praying for y'all. Y'all pray for us. But he's also saying, um, we love y'all and we know you're struggling and we know you've got some challenges, but uh, after I write this letter, I'm getting back to work. So pray for them. I'm, I'm not going to just sit around here and, uh, and think about whether y'all are going to get this or not. Here's the truth. I'm going back to work for the Lord. All right. Just he's just as an example, he's doing what he just he's he's doing what he just told him, them to do. And he says, OK, so he's saying, pray for us that the gospel will be spread uh, rapidly and glor uh, and be glorified just as it did also with you. And and that's another thing he's saying. He's like, look, the gospel we preach to you is the truth and there's nothing else to look for. He's, he's just verifying that to them. All right. Don't. Take confidence in what you first believe. And verse two, that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men for not all have faith. He's still, this is a, we're in the same boat. Part of the message that he's saying, All right? He's like, not everybody's, not everybody has faith. Not everybody's of God. Not everybody is on the same plan. Not everybody thinks the same thing or believes the same thing. So we're going to you pray for us because we got the same kind of problems over here that you guys are having because the people that were bringing false teaching to them about missing the, the, the return of Christ. Those are not people of God. And he's like, we got the same kind of people over here. OK, but the Lord is faithful. Y'all verse three. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one from Satan. Now you remember, and I think it's Ephesians where it, where it tells us that uh, the enemy is not flesh and blood, right? He's trying. He's trying to tell the Ephesians, y'all stop fighting one another because that's not your enemy. It's Satan who's doing all this nonsense. He's the enemy, and he's saying the same thing here, right? He says the Lord's faithful. He's strengthen you and protect you from the evil one, which we can all say praise the Lord and amen, hallelujah, because we all know when Jesus taught the, his disciples how to pray, he part of that prayer or that model prayer was that we should ask the Lord for protection from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation and protect us from evil or the evil one. All right. So, so it's like he says the Lord is faithful. We have, okay, verse four, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. There's nothing like a brother or sister in Christ who is helping you uh, in, a, in, in your walk with Christ, inserting truth into your life that comes from the word of God. And it's hard to say to them, to us, it's hard for us to hear because it's hard for us. It's challenging. When, when I need to hear something, when, when a brother needs to come to me and lovingly show me in the word of God where it says to suck it up and get back to doing your, what you're called to do, stop having a pity party, then I, I don't want to hear that. But I have to hear it. But it's always good that when what follows that is God is in you and he, you have everything you need to do it, what God's called you to do, what, God, what the scripture is teaching you to do. We have everything we need to be strong believers in Christ in this world. We already have it. It's not something we have to really try hard in our own strength to do. The hardest thing about the Christian life is surrendering to what the Spirit of God is doing. What the Word of God is trying to get us to do. That's the hardest thing. We, 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 have, we have this terrible need to go out into the world and try really hard in our own strength to go make disciples. When if we would just surrender to the Lord, surrender to the word, pay attention to the spirit of God and let him have what he's trying to take and receive what he's trying to give, we will automatically make disciples. That's probably not the best 
God will make disciples in us, through us. Because we're not really doing anything, are we? But we have to make a decision, a willful decision to stand firm and let God help us be faithful. All right? So that's why we pray for one another. We know God is faithful. So the only way we can fail is if we're not faithful. And he's like, look, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. He's saying, we believe that God is going to work in you. We believe that you're not going to fail. You can't, you can't preach somebody down and then not build them back up. You can't do it that way. That's why Paul was such a good, uh, a good teacher and a good uh, preacher in his day. All right, so uh, see, concerning doing the will. Okay, verse uh, five. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Why do you suppose he's saying that to them? Aside from it just sounds pleasant, <laughs> right? Because Paul knows that that's where they need to be in order to be successful in standing firm. That's where we need to be. We all need to be in the love of God and into the steadfast the steadfastness of Christ. Every time we get in trouble or every time we shrink back or every time we have problems in our spiritual walk, it's because we're, we're, we're getting away from this place. We're, we're, we're not as close to, to Jesus as we really need to be or, or as the spirit of God is trying to get us to be. So he's just saying, he's just speaking words of blessing into their life. He's like, look, may the Lord direct your hearts. May the spirit of God lead you, Right? into the love of God. Remember, he just said in the last chapter, God will give them the desires of their heart. He's like, look, if they want the wickedness, I'll give it to them. But if you want Jesus, I'll give you that. The steadfastness of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ. Aren't y'all glad that God never gets tired? <laughs> like, like fatigued? If, he, if, God would, if God were uh, such a being that he would actually get fatigued, I think most of us would just wear him out. <laughs> think about it. I, I'm saying that about myself. The Lord, if he was one that would get fatigued, I personally would, would just exhaust him. <laughs> because that's just what, you know, that's, I need a lot of attention from him. But I praise the Lord that he's never ending. And it's like there's no end to him. There's no end to his love. There's no end to his patience. There's no end to his grace. There's no end to his forgiveness. Go on down the list of everything about the Lord. It's, there's, it's never ending, y'all. All right. Verse, four, uh, verse six. Here we go. Let's see what we got here. Now we command you. I like when he says command you because it. It gets a, it's an attention getter type phrase. And he's he's basically reminding them that he, as an apostle, has the authority to command them to insist that they do these things. Because, you know, anytime human beings feel like there's an option. To do something or not, guess what we're not going to do. Almost every time, because I know I know that y'all think it's just me, but. We don't really like to be told what to do. We just don't. All right. So we need to be commanded. We need to be told that there's some authority make, telling us this is what needs to happen. All right. I command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, so he's not only uh, asserting his own authority that's given to him by God, but he's making sure that they know it's not him personally. It's the authority of God. Here it is. Here it is right here. Keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Wow. Wow. <laughs> we have to say, what does that mean, don't we? Right? I was, I was thinking about that when I was reading that, and I was like, better not nobody get up and leave <laughs> when I read that. <laughs> you know, just take it that literal. No, it's, it, he's saying, look, Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the way my, my own father, my own dad, when I was uh, somewhere in high school age, and I start, hang, you know, you start hanging around with people and you start, got friends and whatever. That was about, that was about the time when I started 
being free in the world more often and didn't have to be home when the lights were on on the streets and all that kind of stuff. And I hanging around with some of the wrong people on occasion. And my dad got a hold of me one time and he looked me in the eye with his blue eyes, poked me in the chest like he always did. And he said, you will be just like the people you hang out with. And I was like fully prepared for some long lecture. And that was all he said. He just said, you will be just like the people you hang out with. And then he turned around and walked out of the room. And I'll never forget, I've never forgot that. What he's saying is, if you want to be like uh, these hooligans, then go hang out with them. <laughs> no, these ones over here. No, these ones over here. <laughs> no, no. But, uh, no if you, but if you want to be like uh, these successful people, then go hang out with them. That's, that's what he was telling and Paul's saying to them, look, you need to keep away from those who lead unruly lives. Unruly lives, meaning meaning, he really wasn't talking so much about the wicked people that they were dealing with. He was talking about those who are either believers or claiming to be believers, but they weren't really serious about their faith and their walk with Christ. They're just basically lazy in their faith. They're just not really interested. And it's almost like they got their ticket to heaven and they're just waiting for the bus to show up. And they're not interested in anything else that goes along with it. Lazy believers. That's the only way to describe it. They're just lazy. Somebody else will make it. Somebody else will love that person. Somebody else will sit in a pew at church next Sunday. I don't need to go. So somebody else will do this good deed. Somebody else will worship the Lord. I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not interested. Right? He's saying don't hang around with those kind of people. Don't surround yourself with people who you, you might pick up bad habits from. Now, that's hard to understand because I, I always thought that God wanted us to go seek those kind of people out and help them. Right? Be an influence. Help them grow and help them maybe not be lazy anymore. Or maybe not be... Uh, uh, whatever he, uh, the unruly, however he wants to describe it. So it's, it's, it's tough to know who those people are and what not to do and who not to hang out with. Because if we take that, if we take that in a legalistic, literal manner, then we would constantly be having to place judgment on one another every day. We would have to look at each other like, hmm, is this one of them unruly people? Is this one of them lazy people? Right, because one day they might be that way, and one day they might not be. If it's up to our, if it's up to our discerning who they are and how they are, no, he's just saying, look, don't surround yourself with people who are going to pull you away from everything I just told you to do and be, like standing firm, like having confidence, like uh, uh, being uh, faithful and depending on the Lord and seeking the Lord, doing the work of the church. If somebody, if, if people are pulling you away from that, then maybe you should find a different crowd to hang out with. Verse seven, let's see what else he says. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, right? He's like, whatever we showed you while we was there, that's what the way you should be. And, I, and I've told, I told this to my son because I, I try to pass on what my dad told me about hanging out with the wrong crowds to him, Right? Like I knew what I was talking about. I really, it wasn't me. It was my dad told me that. So I just act like I was wise, you know, pass it on to him. And I said, and, he, and my son, being who he was, he said, but, but dad, there's no other kind of people to hang out with. I was like, well, I said, if that's the case, then you need to figure some way to help, help them be different because you can't be like them if they're going to be crazy and, and go do things that are going to get you in trouble. Either that or you're just going to have to be by yourself. And that's what it means to make disciples, y'all. Sometimes making disciples is helping each other be disciples. Sometimes making disciples, and most of the time, is out and doing evangelism and getting people to become disciples. We disciple one another, right? Because if we just get somebody to confess Christ and be saved, baptized and forgiven and all of that, and then we sing victory in Jesus and then never, ever, help them learn and never ever walk with them and never ever share with them and never ever spend any time 
learning from each other that way, then we're not discipling. Guaranteed, guaranteed, if that is the way it is, those people who were just baptized will walk away from the Lord because they'll believe that it's really not, there's nothing to it. It's not real. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. So he's just saying, he's just trying to say, look, you guys are the church. And the church is not looking for somebody else to be like other than Jesus. We're trying to be like Jesus. We're not trying to be like anybody else in the world. In fact, we're trying to show the world here is the model. Here's what it is. Come and be, come and come and do what we're doing so you can be like Jesus the way we're trying to be like Jesus. Or Paul, for example. All right, all right, let me see. Let's see. Verse, verse eight, it says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working na- day, uh, excuse me, night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Okay, so you uh, let me remember finish reading this. Verse nine says, Not because we do not have the right to this but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. And and there's been plenty of uh, scholars and Bible studiers and believers and people in general who think that Paul was arrogant and uh, thought a lot of himself because of these kinds of phrases that he said, right? He's not saying, I'm doing doing it right, you should be like me. He's, he's really saying, we're trying to follow Jesus the best we can, so you come along and do that with us. We're just trying to disciple you. We're just trying to show you what we know so you can do it that way. Not because we're doing it right or we're best at it. It's just because we're the ones who taught you, so you should probably consider that. Right? And, and, and by the way, that means whoever, whoever I have in my life that's teaching me, I need to make sure that they're teaching the same thing that Jesus taught, the same thing that the scripture teaches, the same thing that the spirit of God would lead me to do in my life. Otherwise, I need to get away from that. All right. So he's why is he talking about people's bread and food and paying for food and all that stuff? Right. I think he's just using that as an example to show that we're not to be bur- a burden on anybody. We're not to take from people. We're not takers. We're, we're actually uh, don't have any need to take because the Lord provides for us. Notice he said, uh, I had every right to expect you to be hospitable to me. But I didn't because I didn't want it to distract you. I didn't want you to think I was here just preaching the gospel so you'll give a bunch of money to me. And there's a lot of people in the world still today that are doing that very thing. They're selling the gospel is what they're doing for their own gain. And they will, they will, we're not to be those people, Right. So how, how many people hear me say those things and they're like, well, well, don't you get a salary preacher? <laughs> right. And I do. And it's it's uh, appropriate, according to scripture, for that to happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it, it's appropriate for that to happen. Just consider me an ox. Consider the preacher an ox where the Bible says, do not muzzle the ox while he's working. It's only fair that he should eat while he's doing his work, right? So that's really, he's not saying it's wrong to be hospitable to whoever's preaching. He's just saying uh, when you go into the world and make disciples, when you go and teaching others, don't do it for your own gain. Don't make a burden out of yourself to anybody. Verse 10 says, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone, look, here it is. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Hey, like that. I've heard that ever since I asked her. Well, <laughs> your generation was brought up that way, period. And that was, that was the way it was in many homes. If you didn't get up and do your chores and work with the family, you ain't sitting at the table. But nowadays, you'd be in trouble for neglecting your children. <laughs> you know, there, there's just, you know, everybody understands that part of Scripture. Everybody can quote that scripture, whether they're saved or not. They can quote. If you don't eat, if you don't work, you don't eat. It's a good principle to live by. In fact, when 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 Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. God said to Adam is like, if you want to eat, you're going to work. Part of the consequences for sinning against God. Okay, I like to eat. A few times a day, as a matter of fact. So I guess I better do something, right? And I think that's not just about working 
in your jobs or physic, doing physical labor, I believe that Paul is trying to tell this church about the kingdom of God and about how, how this Christian life works and how we're to participate in being part of the body of Christ. Right? If we want the benefits of being a part of the body of Christ, if we want to live in, 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 a, in a life that's covered by the blood of Christ, if we, want, if we want to be saved people, then our commitment to Jesus when we got saved was not just for salvation only. We said, I surrender all to him. I'm surrendering my kingdom to yours. That means I'm yours. I'm available to you. Whatever you want to do with me, I'm here to do it. That means I got to get up every day and say, okay, what are we doing today, Lord, for your kingdom? How am I serving you today? How am I loving people today? How am I loving you today? I'm ready. I'm available. And then be ready because he's going to lead you to do something that you don't want to do. To love somebody you don't really want to love. To get rid of something that you don't really want to get rid of. And if you don't work, see, being a part of the Christian life or the, or the, the kingdom of God as a believer, as the body of Christ, is hard work. And if we're going to be like the Thessalonians who were just, I mean, they just got lazy. They were sitting around waiting for Jesus to come back. And they were like, okay, well, there's no need to do anything else. And he's, he's trying to get them busy because there's people who aren't saved. We have a God who is to be glorified by those who are believers. And if you're not, if your life is not glorifying God by uh, the work that you're doing for the kingdom of God via the help of the Holy Spirit, then you would be a lazy Christian. Love y'all. Don't try to hurt you, but that's what it means. And if we're being lazy, then what makes us believe we're going to belly up to God's table and reap, reap the fruit of his harvest? What makes us believe that people are going to come into our fellowship and get saved if we're not actually out there doing the work? You see, we all want to pray for, this, for, the, for the harvest. We want to pray for the fruit, but we don't want to do the work it takes to get there. I'm not saying, I, I, I don't mean to say that as we don't, we don't want to, like we're re refusing and rejecting, but there's, there's a disconnect here somewhere. Our, our, our desires somehow, some, it, it's a standing firm issue, I think. Because standing firm in what we believe isn't just defending against the enemy. It's also being intentional and on fire for going out and making disciples. Because that's who we are. And that's what we're commanded to do. It's almost like it's a, it's a resolve that we have to enter into every day of our lives willingly. I will do what the Lord leads me to do to make disciples today, no matter what. Those are strong believers. Those are ones who are fully committed. Those are ones who are busy about the Lord's business. And it will look different every day. Because you'll encounter different folks every day, different people, different problems, different situations. Maybe it'll just be a day full of worship, totally by yourself. Maybe you're driving on a long trip and you're just, you and the Lord, worshiping and talking while you're driving down the road. That's part of the work. That's part of the busyness. That's part of what we do. Okay. Oh, okay, if you're not willing to work, you're not going to eat. For, for we hear that some, uh, some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. I had to look up what a busybody is. <laughs> I've, I've heard that term plenty of times, but I just need to make sure I understand what a busybody is. Because <laughs> it's not a term that I was growing up using. I've heard it a bunch of times, but the, 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 what I learned basically is a busybody is busy about getting involved in other people's business all the time. They're doing a lot of stuff, but they're, 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 they're kind of stirring up problems. You, you, you've probably met some people like that. They just show up, start a bunch of mess, and then they're gone. 
and leaving y'all to just deal with it. All right? Don't be that person. That's not that's not a person who is uh, representing the body of Christ. These are undisciplined people. You, you know that word. Undis- he says he said they're leading an undisciplined life. Okay. The only way to lead an undisciplined life is to believe that you're in charge of your life. I know it's hard to hear. It's hard for me to even say it out loud because I don't even like it to be true for me. But if I'm surrendered to, 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 to Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I'm giving my life to him, I'm not in charge of it anymore. Not even one part of it, not even a small bit of it. I'm not in charge anymore. All of it is his or none of it. That's how it works. So if I can't stay committed to him and stay faithful to my commitment to him, then I'm undisciplined. And regardless if I like it or not, I'm a problem among the believers when I'm like that. And you don't want to be that. We don't want he, Paul doesn't want these people to be like that. He's trying to help them say, look, this teaching you heard is, is false. Here's the truth. Once again, here's the truth. Here's how to stand firm in it. You have everything you need. You guys are awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. In fact, I'm going to pray that you do it even more. And when every time Paul warns believers about other people or other believers, he's really not talking bad about those other people or those other believers. He's saying to them, do not be like these people. Here's what it doesn't look like to be a believer. All right. So we're not going to be busybodies. Now, such a person, I'm almost done, y'all. Now, such a person, uh, uh, such persons, uh, we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Mind your own business. Lead quiet lives. Love God. But as for you, brethren, do not go grow weary of doing good. Anybody ever get tired of doing good? Some some of you are like, I don't even know what that means. How could you be tired? Of, and I'm, I, we, it can happen. It can happen. Sometimes, sometimes it can happen to be like the same situation over and over again. And God just keeps telling you, keep loving them people. Just keep doing it. Don't grow weary of doing good. When we grow weary of doing good, when we get tired of doing good, or when we get burdened by doing good, there's a heart issue there. There's something wrong. Between us and the Lord. It's not, a, it's not a salvation issue. It's just a. Maybe we're just drifting off the path. Just a little bit. All right. If anyone does not obey uh, our instruction in this letter. Take special note of that person. Here it is again. He's, t- he's saying don't hang around people. Do not. And do not associate with them. Uh, with, with him. So that he will be put to shame. It's the same as the other instruction. Where it says. Uh, cast out the unrepentant brother. For, so that he might know his wicked ways. And return to the fellowship. Y'all. See, see, Paul's never saying uh, just be a jerk and dismiss people from your life because you don't like them or they don't agree with you. He's not saying stuff like that. He's like, look, we love people enough to let them know that there's a problem so that they will repent. It's our desire that they will get back right with God. Yet, verse 15, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Circle that and put a star next to it. Now, may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. That would be nice. It's possible, right? To have peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is uh, a distinguishing mark in every uh, every letter. This is the, the way I write. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. That last statement was him, was him saying to them, this is me. Because the other letters that they were getting, the other writings they were getting with the false teachings, they were claiming it was Paul writing it, and it wasn't Paul. So he's just like, look, you you can know that this is me because this is the way I write. That other letter, I don't write that way. I don't talk that way. I don't say things that way to you. You know me, right? If If your spouse or your parents ever wrote you a letter, you probably could tell if it was really them or not, even in a letter, because you know each other. How do we know it's God when he's, t- when he's talking to us? How do we know it's the spirit of God when he's leading us? Because we know him. We have spent time with him. If you spend time in the word of God, you will know whoever wrote whatever you're reading. You will get to know who they are and how they write and what they're about. 
so that when false teaching, even in today's world, comes along, you can say, that doesn't sound familiar to me. And then the Spirit of God would be like, uh, you better double check that. Right. Because it doesn't match who we are. It doesn't match who God is. So it's it's out. We, have, we, have, we all got to get like a reject button on our sh- sleeve or something. When false teaching comes around, just push it. Reject it. <laughs> right? Or an eject button. That's even better. You just push it. It just flips it right out of your mind. That's that's the Thessalonians. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Main, main points for the Thessalonians. Stand firm. Be encouraged. Pray hard and work hard. Pray hard and work hard. And, and then... Uh, count on walking in God's peace because of it. Right? I love you and the Lord loves you. Let's pray and I'll be finished. I'm a little bit over. I told you. I told you it wasn't going to be short. Lord, we love you and we thank you for today. I thank you for the word. Thank you for all the people that's been able to come out tonight and study with us and I thank you for all the ones that do study with us online as well. We just ask for you to uh, expose our hearts to your truth and have your spirit have his way in our hearts so that we might be the best we can be for you. Help us to stand firm. Help us to surrender. Help us to let you be Lord of our lives. And Lord, help us to be the witness in this world. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.